Good morning, I'm thankful to be here. I would like to share with you a message from God's Word. And as we begin, I'd like to open us again with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, allow your word to be spoken powerfully here in this place. Allow your children to praise you with a pure tongue. And I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will fill this room in a special way. And I pray, Lord, that you would be exalted in this message. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. A few decades ago, a philosopher by the name of Peter Kreeft wrote a book called The Snake Bite Letters. Now, some of you, I'm sure probably none of you have heard of that particular book, but some of you might have heard of a book by a man by, by the name of C.S. Lewis, uh, the man who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. He also wrote a book called The Screwtape Letters, which book was a pretend dialogue between an elder demon or tempter to a younger demon teaching this younger demon how best to assault the children of God. And Lewis writes from this point of view in order to give the Christian an insight into how they may be attacked and thereby might defend themselves from such an attack. Now, the debate in that particular age was really concerning godly living. It wasn't really concerning whether or not there was a God. In the 1950s, by and large, virtually everyone accepted that there was a God. Uh, now that's not quite the case. Even by the late 1980s, atheism had arose and arisen in a great way. Peter Kreeft wrote a book in the same style as the screw tape letters, which he called the snake bite letters. And within this book, this elder demon, snake bite, tells uh, this younger tempter that there's a new battle plan against the kingdom of God. This is the way we're going to fight. We're going to we're going to undermine what God has always said about reality. And this is what God has said, basically. This is how God set up the order, that there was to be an egalitarianism or an equality between people and an elitism of ideas. An equality between people and an elitism of ideas, which is to say, some things are true and other things are false, but regardless of who puts forth either the truth or the falsehood, they have an inherent and intrinsic quality within them that puts them on equal footing because they have within them the very image of God. This particular book tried to demonstrate that the attack against Christianity is going to come by twisting those around, by reversing the goal of God with the goal of the enemy. The enemy would then be to make an elitism between people and a relativism between ideas. This is where we get the relativism of truth, where there is no truth, and this is where we enter into the secular age. You'll see how this manifests itself as now, since all truth is either my truth or your truth, not necessarily true for me, what's true for you, uh, this, is, this has become what we call modern-day secularism. Now, secularism, as you might know, uh, as defined by Os Guinness at least, is the process by which religious ideas and values lose their social significance. This is not to say that you're not allowed to believe in God, but that culturally your faith is not relevant. That's what the world means by secular. The secular world considers evangelistic faith to be oppressive, backwards, offensive, and above all, void of objective reason due to religious bias. So in other words, you have a voice, but it should be ignored because you're biased. The agenda of secularism is not so much to ban faith in God, but to permit its free exercise only in private. However, even private expressions of faith are making their way into more and more public spheres as the acts of conscience of business owners, for example, uh, in respect to abortion, insurance, or homosexuality and wedding cakes is now determining whether or not Christians are able to conduct business in America. This is, this is old news. We know all this. We've been hearing this for years. At least in some cases, one must disobey their conscience before God in order to possess the legal right to buy and sell. So the world has, for two centuries, so you want to know where this came from, for over two centuries now, it's been crying out that there is no good or evil. They say there's no good or evil. The greatest philosophers and scientists of our highest institutions compound this by crying out that there is no truth, that there is no meaning, that uh, that nothing is objective, 
Everything is subjective, they say. By the way, that's a self-defeating statement. If nothing is objective, well, is that objectively true? That statement, they've just defeated their own, uh, their own philosophy. So the spirit of this age simply says this. Do what makes you feel good. Because there's no truth. There's no one to judge you. There's no true right or wrong. That's just another way of saying, do what is right in your own eyes. And all the while, the objective historic truth concerning Jesus Christ is ridiculed because the one objective truth that is wholly embraced by the spirit of the age is this. God is dead. Faith in him is powerless. That's the spirit of the age. So then, all who follow God are to be ignored, or if given a voice, they are to be dismissed as unreliable. So concerning this issue of relevance and uh, social confidence, I want you to just consider this for a moment. Imagine that you were to see a, a panel on television where they were to discuss, it could be anything, it could be abortion, uh, anything. Uh, and on that panel, they were to have a medical doctor, a philosopher, a bioethicist, a psychologist, a sociologist, and a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who do you think our culture would think is the least qualified? to offer an informed opinion on such a subject. Clearly the minister. The minister would be thought to be the most biased and therefore least objective and least qualified of the group when in fact he would be the only one who possessed the objective truth. You see, they, the scientist, the medical examiner would come in and show facts within this realm, but you can't get to right and wrong from those issues. You have to come from outside, from the, uh, from the, the spiritual realm to, uh, to understand right and wrong because God has created and therefore God gets to define what is right and what is wrong. And so the minister would be the one who is the most biased. And this is, this is just one example. Ravi Zacharias, if you're familiar with him, he's commented on this issue by sharing a story about his time living in Toronto in the 1980s. About 120 years ago, Toronto used to be called Toronto the Good because it was a city that was filled with such goodness and cleanliness and uh, there was so little poverty because the churches were so involved in helping the people. There was so little sin, uh, retrospectively and in comparison to the surrounding cities, because of the influence of Christianity. Fast forward 100 years to the late 1980s. Uh, Robbie Zacharias got up one morning, went out to his mailbox, and uh, he received in his mailbox a pornographic magazine. 1989, I believe it was. And uh, the lead article of this pornographic magazine was how men are able to seduce boys. And this was not just a private solicitation to him. It was given to thousands of residents within the city. Thousands of people received this pornographic magazine without having been solicited. And so there was a public outcry about this. They didn't like this, obviously. This is the late 1980s. They, they disliked the idea of, of being forced to receive this in their mailbox. And the mayor's office received thousands of phone calls and letters. Now, what did he do? He went on public news on the local Toronto news station, and he made a public announcement stating, yes, I understand a lot of people are upset about this literature being passed around, but I had to ignore several thousands of the complaints because the majority of those complaints came from church-going religious people. And we all know that church-going religious people are biased in this matter, and so they don't have an objective opinion. They're too subjective in their reasoning. Did you see that? Did you catch the subtleness in which he did that? He said that because you're a Christian, your voice doesn't matter. Because you believe one thing, you're considered biased and unable to make any sort of relevant contribution to a discussion. Well, there was in initially a, a court case that, that came following this, uh, a court case against the owner of the magazine, and the defense lawyer of the uh, pornographic magazine owner took this particular line of attack, and this is where I think it's going to meet the road for you when you wonder, how is it that we've lost our way of thinking in this world? Why is it that we've lost the way to think about the things of God? This is what the lawyer said. He took one of the witnesses, it's just a person giving testimony about having received the literature. They picked a, you know, a smart guy to represent them. And he asked this particular individual, he says, Pardon me, sir, have you ever walked into an art gallery? Yes, I have. Okay, have you ever paid to go into an art gallery? Yes, I've done that, he said. He said, have you ever paid to go into an art gallery where they were displaying the works of the masters? 
And he says, yes, in fact, I have paid to go into an art gallery where they were displaying the works of the masters. He says, have you paid to go into an art gallery where the works of the masters displayed nude people? And he said, yes, yes, I have. And he said, would you please describe to the jury why you consider that art in my client's magazine to be pornography? He said, explain to me the difference between why that is considered art and what my client produces is pornography. He didn't have anything to say in response. He had no clue how to answer that question. It reminds me of a story written by, again, this is C.S. Lewis in the 1930s. He wrote a book by the name of Pilgrim's Progress. Has anyone here read Pilgrim's Regress, by the way? I'm sorry. Uh, John Bunyan in the 1600s wrote a book called Pilgrim's Progress. It's one of the most popular Christian books of all time after the Bible. Uh, in the 1930s, Lewis wrote a book called The Pilgrim's Regress. And in this particular section of the book, the pilgrim, whose name is John, is trapped in the dungeon of the spirit of the age. And he's given a breakfast. And as he looks at his breakfast, he smells the eggs and he says... These eggs smell great, and he takes a bite. These eggs are delicious. And the spirit of age says to him, oh, you're so foolish. Why would you say such a thing? It's just, it's just a piece of, of, of mo it's just molecules from an egg, uh, from, from a chicken. It's, it's, it's just like a chicken's excrement. What's the difference? He basically says. And John was very taken aback by that, didn't know quite how to respond. And then he had a nice glass of milk, said, this milk is delicious. And the spirit of the age says, why, why do you say that's delicious? It doesn't mean anything to say it's delicious. It's just a secretion of a cow. And this made him feel even worse. And uh, he didn't know quite how to respond. And then reason comes running in on a horse. And reason takes John away. And he defeats, or she actually, she's a lady, she defeats the spirit of the age. And she says, you fool, you lie. You do not understand what nature has intended for nourishment versus what nature has intended for refuse. And so there are three Primary evils concerning the spirit of the age, which we must address. Secularism, relativism, materialism. And this is my last uh, brief uh, bit of introduction before we get into our text and our sermon. Uh, you're probably familiar with the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. The end of the 18th century. He predicted that with the death of God movement, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but by the end of the 19th century, which is the end of the 1800s, uh, there was a death of God movement where the elites in society believed that there was no God. And this is what Friedrich Nietzsche, who was an atheist, said. He said that with the death of God, that the 20th century would become the bloodiest and the most sinful and hedonistic society the world had ever seen. Did you hear that? He said that since in the 19th century God had died, he said that therefore the 20th century would be the bloodiest century and the most sensually hedonistic throughout the history of the world. And he was right. Tens of millions killed in Germany, another tens of millions killed in Russia, tens of millions killed in China. In fact, the, the bloodiness that occurred in the 20th century outnumbers the bloodiness of every crusade and every war in the history of the world up to that point. Ravi Zacharias uh, also commented on this, stating that without God, there's really only two options for men to follow after. Uh, those uh, two options are really the only things to which a man could devote himself wholly. When a nation forgets God, he says, there is a pursuit of either power or pleasure. Adolf Hitler or Hugh Hefner, military might or unrestrained sensuality, the swastika or playboy and contraceptives. Those are your choices if you abandon God, he says. And the 20th century bears him out on that. And this brings us to the sermon. You see, there are several issues which need to be addressed in our nation. But I don't want us to care so much about this American experiment nationalistically compared to how we care for the salvation of souls of its people before God. Because the people who believe these things, who practice these things and do these things are just like you and me before we were given grace by Christ. And therefore, shouldn't we, oughtn't we, to be all the more zealous because of the, in, in face of all this great evil, to be kind, to be loving, to bring forth the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I want to talk a little bit about this. How do we critique sinful habits when in the world, the word sin is actually a cultural taboo? You say the word sin, and you're going to shut down a lot of conversations right there. Uh, now, 
that we have seen that we do have a dire state of affairs, I want to share with you God's response. God's response to this sinful world. Please turn to Romans chapter 1. Now, Romans is the largest epistle written by the Apostle Paul. The church in Rome had existed for uh, at least a few years before he came. He wrote this letter prior to his coming to Rome, of course. And he had wanted to come many times, but had been prevented for various reasons. And what I'd like to do is read verses 1 through 7. And if you're willing, please stand for the reading of God's Word. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. What I'd like to do is offer you something that has historically been the one remedy that the church has always offered, but not so much in the past 30 years. Not so much in the past 30 years. You see, the past 30 years, actually, I suppose you could go back to the 1960s if you really wanted to trace it. But particularly the past 30 years, the church has thought that the power of God is in a persuasive message. They thought that the power of God was in an articulate speaker. They thought that the power of God was in the kindness of someone who could then live a godly example. And they thought that the power of God, for instance, can be demonstrated by making beautiful programs. We see this in things like VBS. If we can make children uh, feel very comfortable in a church setting, perhaps they'll be more likely to embrace Christ. Now, that might be a very good thing in and of itself, but the VBS, the, the, the pageantry, that is not the power of God. The power of God is the gospel. And it's amazing that this comes, this letter comes in light of to whom it's being written. The church in Rome. Rome at that time, as you probably know very well, was the world's superpower. It was probably the greatest power up to that point, in terms of, even if you look at Daniel's vision concerning uh, the legs of, of stone and iron. Uh, in Rome, they had the, uh, the, the palace of the emperors. They had the, uh, the roads. The road system was the world's envy at that time. They had the Colosseum, which was a marvel of engineering. In fact, the concrete used to construct the buildings in Rome is far superior to the concrete that we use. We've only discovered, I believe it was last year, the recipe for Roman concrete. You wonder why our buildings break down after a few decades or 100 years? It's because the Romans were smarter than us. Uh, we've recently rediscovered that, and we've seen that they were masters of building. They were masters in all sorts of construction, and most of all, they were masters of military might, and they were the world's superpower. And yet, Paul comes on the scene because there is a power greater than the power of Rome. The greatest power in Rome was the gospel. And so he calls himself Paul. He uses his Roman name. He, he was also named Saul. That's his Hebrew name. Paul means little. And he, I believe he chooses to use this name little in, uh, in, because Jesus had called him Paul after his conversion and because it demonstrates that it's not about him. Why? Because he is, what's the next word? A slave, if I may correct the translation. It doesn't say servant in the Greek. It says slave. The Greek word is doulos. Anyone who's uh, perhaps followed John MacArthur's ministry or R.C. Sproul, you've probably heard this before, that... The term used for servant most of the time in the New Testament is actually the term for slave. And Paul is here saying that he was a slave of Jesus Christ. Now, the reason that the translators change it so often in American translations is because we hear the word slavery and we think of 18th century American slavery. 
That's not the kind of slavery that, that happened in the Bible. In the Bible, and this is a, a lesson for another time, slaves voluntarily uh, became slaves of a master. They would be a bond servant at first if they couldn't pay a debt, and then after their bond was paid, they could then choose to become a lifelong slave if they loved their master. And so you can see how that relates to Paul. Nonetheless, not a servant, but a slave. What's the difference? A servant can choose not to go to work today. A slave must do the entire will of his master. And that's what Paul is saying that he must do. Of whom is he a slave? Of Christ Jesus. There is no better master. We're going to get uh, deeper into detail about precisely who is Christ Jesus according to this gospel. He says, first of all, I was called. I was called, he said, by Christ Jesus, the anointed Savior. Paul is just an instrument in the Redeemer's hand, so to speak. He says he was called. He didn't appoint himself to the ministry. Uh, if you look at the conversion of Saul to Paul in the book of Acts, you see that he was on his way to persecute the church. He was on his way to kill Christians. We, we don't see that in America that often. Uh, the people who we think hate the church the most would never think of laying their hands on someone. And this, this, is, this is Paul here going to take Christians before the council so that they can be tried and executed. And God stops him in his tracks and brings him to Christ. Through the glory of his grace, he was called. And so are we, if we're called. We're called not just to be saved, but we're called to a purpose. Paul's particular purpose was to be an apostle. An apostle was just one who was chosen uh, by God to be a particular minister. Uh, they were messengers, uh, very similar to the word uh, angel, which also means messenger. We have the word apostolon, which is someone who carries a letter. Uh, he carries epistles, uh, epistolaries. And the most important, perhaps, aspect of this message, well, definitely the most important aspect of this message, is that it is the gospel of God. I want you to think about that. He says, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. What does it mean that it's the gospel of God as opposed to just the gospel? The gospel of God means this. The gospel of God means that it comes from God and belongs to God. Now, this is a very important aspect because oftentimes in our day and age, we hear the word God and it, and it comes out of our mouths as simply or as easily as if we were saying the word water or as if we were saying tree or church or car. We have no reverence for the name of God. I listened to a pastor preach about this text and he mentioned that he and his wife watched those you know, Property Brothers shows or those shows you know, where they renovate houses and show it to the people, or uh, this other show where they renovate the house and the family goes away, then they come back. And he said, you can, you can guess to a T, once they reveal the new house that they've made, which is really magnificent, precisely what the wife is going to say. Uh, 95 times out of 100, she's going to say these words, and we even have an abbreviated version of it for Facebook, and it's, and it's this, O-M-G. They'll say, oh my God. And I say that hesitantly because you might be aware that to misuse the name of God is blasphemy. And I know, these, I know the people that are using this aren't cognitively trying to blaspheme the name of God. But how often, perhaps even some of us in this church, we use that phrase because we think so lightly of God. We feel like we can just use his name flippantly. And what was the very first petition of the Lord's Prayer? What was the very first petition? He says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come is not the first petition. Hallowed be thy name is the first petition. The King James, hallowed means to make holy. You're basically saying, God, make holy your name. How is the world going to make holy the name of God if we treat it so lightly? This is a message that comes from God himself, the gospel of God. It's the source and the owner. And if it is God's gospel, what does that mean above all else? It means that we do not change the gospel. It is God's gospel. It is not man's gospel. It is not to be changed. And yet, we feel like that's what we have to do to make it palatable to people. We feel like we have to make it just a little easier to swallow. Coat it with chocolate. You know, Martin Luther, the, uh, the great uh, reformer in the 16th century, in his very last sermon that he preached, I believe it was 1646, uh, he was called to preach uh, to, 
to resolve a dispute between these two nobles in Germany. And his, and his message concerned the power of the gospel. And he said, you know what? You know what's really sad, church? He said, you know, of all the teachers in the world, God must be the most impoverished teacher. God must be the most impoverished teacher because he's the one that everyone wants to correct. Everyone wants to be God's guidance counselor. Everyone wants to say, no, 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 no. The Bible doesn't really mean that. It means this. Doesn't that sound better? That's the idea of the spirit of the age influencing the gospel of God. But also notice, set apart for the gospel. He's set apart. He's sanctified through holy living, through living for Christ. And he's set apart for the gospel. It's for a particular purpose. Uh, if, you're, if you're anything like my church, you probably have a great understanding of the Bible. You probably have an excellent uh, understanding of salvation. Uh, you've probably uh, memorized several verses in Scripture. Uh, but if you're anything like my church and like most churches, uh, most American churches, uh, you might be weak on soul winning. I know a few of you aren't. I know a few of you have invited people to church even this day. Uh, but how often do we go out and we talk to people specifically to bring up the gospel? Paul would never have an opportunity missed where he had the opportunity to share Jesus Christ with someone. It's only their eternal life, but we say we don't want to be a bother. We don't want to be a burden. But at the day of judgment, when that person is about to be judged who is your neighbor, and you never told them about Jesus, and, you, and they say, why didn't you tell me I'm going to be going to hell? Why didn't you tell me about Jesus? I just didn't want to bother you. I thought it would be me forcing my religion on you. You know, we've got to talk about the gospel. I'm not saying we have to be annoying the way that we do it, but we must do it because that's the purpose for which we are called. This is the only time in the history of the universe where we will be allowed to serve God by faith. Do you know what that means? You know, you know why, why Paul, for instance, says there's hope, faith, and love, uh, but of these, love is the greatest because the others pass away? When you get to heaven... You will see God as he is, and it will never be an issue of faith. It will be pure knowledge. All that will be there is love. Now is the only time we have the opportunity to prove God's holiness by faith, and by faith alone. And now I want to talk about the gospel, the gospel of God. We, we've learned that it is God's gospel, and now we're going to see that it is the gospel. The word gospel comes from the Greek term evangelic, euangelion, if if you're curious, the word you there, you and Jelly, is the same word we use for, say, eulogy, uh, to speak a good word. Uh, angelion, angel, means an angel is a messenger. The angelion is a message. So it's a good message. William Tyndale, when he translated the very first English Bible, called it the, good, the glad tidings. This is good news in light of bad news. And unfortunately, we're, we're very commonly forgetting such large portions of the gospel when we present it to our friends and neighbors. So often we say that the gospel is that you can be made right with God. The gospel is that you can have meaning in your life. Or the gospel is that you can have your sins forgiven. Those things are true, but that is not the whole gospel. Those are consequences of the gospel. How do we see the continuity between the Old and New Testament? if not the gospel of the kingdom of God. Starting from Genesis, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, after the curse has come, the serpent has triumphed over Adam and Eve, and sin has broken the world, God comes and he preaches a sermon to Satan, and he says that there will be one born of the woman, the seed of the woman, and she will, her seed will crush your head. You will bruise his heel. That first promise of the gospel, that first promise of the gospel right there in Genesis, that's the gospel of the kingdom, that God is going to triumph over evil. That's the good news. Now, consequently, for a lot of us, that comes as bad news because we are not in and of ourselves good. Because when God comes to set up his kingdom in holiness and righteousness, there's only going to be righteous people there. There's only, and none of us, not one of us, has met the standard of God. You see, the standard of God is perfection, absolute perfection. You veer from it but an inch, and you are guilty of all. James says you break one commandment, you're guilty of breaking all of the commandments. That's why Jesus had to come to be born of a, of a, of a, of a, of a male and female. He had to come from, 
from the line of David. Uh, he was actually the adopted son of Joseph and the biological son of Mary. He was the spiritual son of God, ever God, always God, joined to flesh. This is the great humiliation where God himself comes down. And that's why it's good news. Because for those of us who have sinned, Christ has lived a perfect life. He's lived a perfect life for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf, so that we become the very righteousness of God. And by the way, there's one more aspect to this verse. You're thinking I've taken 20 minutes on verse 1 and 2. I, I, I'm only going to take a few minutes for the remaining verses. Uh, it's the gospel. This is our eighth feature here. It's the gospel. I've heard many times, and I'm sure you have, why is God so narrow? Why, why, why aren't there multiple ways? Or maybe they'll say there are multiple ways to heaven. But Paul is here saying that the way of salvation is the gospel solely. It's the gospel. It's exclusivity. Uh, for God is the source. He's given us his very best gift in giving us his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's found in his word, the power in the word. And we see here in verse 3... Uh, or actually even in verse 2, this was a promise given beforehand through the prophets, through the scriptures. So right there from Genesis 3 onwards, we're hearing about the gospel of Christ. It's not as though the Jews were saved by works, and now we are saved by grace. It's not as though the Buddhist is saved one way, and the Christian is saved the other way. That's why our message is so offensive. You preach this message to people, and they will get angry with you. Even if you do it in the kindest of ways, even if you do it with so much love, sometimes they will not, but oftentimes... It will offend people because you're saying that their way is not good enough for God. Their way falls not just a little bit short. It doesn't even have any merit whatsoever. Uh, n no one in this world has a problem saying, oh, I, I know I'm not perfect. But how many people are comfortable saying there's not a single thing I've done in my entire life that's worthy of praise from God? And that's the condemnation that comes from God. It's a difficult message. And yet, that's where the power is. It's not in the fancy pageantry. It's not in the clothing. It's not in the beauty of the church. It's not in even our kindness or our smiles. Uh, it's in the actual words of the gospel. That same word by which God created the heavens and the earth has the power to change the soul, to transform the human. How else can you describe the conversion of a terrorist, of someone like, uh, someone like Saul of Tarsus who was trying to murder the church, to be changed in an instant? To be changed in an instant to serve the living God and to be the most powerful proclaimer of that gospel. So it was promised beforehand through the scriptures. Moses to Malachi preaches Christ. Jews in the Old Testament, uh, those before even there were Jews, Abraham and Isaac were not Jews, for instance. Uh, it's not until Jacob that we have uh, uh, his descendants, you know, Judah, and we call them the Jews. Uh, were actually called the covenant people of God of the Judaic covenant. The people even before that were all saved by looking ahead to Christ, by trusting in the promise, even back to our sinful parents, Adam and Eve. Do you remember when Cain was born? When Cain was born, Eve said, Behold, I have brought forth a man with God. She basically quotes the same phraseology that God says when he says, I will bring forth from the woman a seed, Eve is basically quoting that passage from Genesis 3. She's basically saying, this is the one. This child is the one who's going to deliver us and set things right. Well, it didn't take very long. That's why they named him Cain. Cain is a very good name. It, it means uh, something to the effect of redeemer or worker, God's worker. Uh, but after just a few years, apparently, they lost their faith in Cain. And then Abel was born, and they had lost their hope. And so the word Abel means vanity. Vapor. So they were looking ahead still. It's not going to be just in our sinful flesh. Something else is going to have to come. It's going to have to be God. That's why God in Jeremiah says, I will give them a new heart, heart of flesh. That's why in Isaiah 43, it says that I will send my servant and he shall be perfect in all his generation. And he shall suffer. He shall suffer the sins of his people. You know, it's just amazing. Even, even the unbelievers... Uh, prophesy correctly concerning Christ. For instance, when Ananias, or 
uh, I believe it's Ennius in the Gospel of John, who was the high priest that year that Jesus was to die. He says, it's better, it's expedient that one man should die for the people than that the whole, man, the whole nation perish. He didn't even know that he was preaching the Gospel and God was using him. The idea being this, that Jesus Christ from the beginning was always going to be a propitiation for, for his people to turn away the very wrath of God to turn the people towards God. And it's concerning his son. And so we can talk all we want to about God, but unless we get personal and talk about the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, you do not have the gospel. You see, God himself in his divine nature could not have made the sacrifice without having become man. God had to become a man. That's not to say that he lost his godness and became a man, but that's rather to say that he joined his godness to a human body, to a human soul. He became one with it. That's not to say he was half God, half man, but he was fully God, fully man. Only that way could he fully experience the trials and the temptations and the difficulties and the opportunities for exercising faith as a man. And at the same time, to bear the infinite wrath of God on the cross as God. He had to be fully man, and he had to be fully God, descended from David, according to the Scriptures. Everything is always according to the Scriptures. The Son of God. The Son of God and the Son of Man. And then look at this in the next passage. In power by the resurrection. Verse 4. And was declared to be the Son of God in power. Notice that word. Power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, the power of his resurrection. I want you to consider that for just a moment. Do you really believe that the same power which caused Jesus to rise from the grave is the power that's made available to us in the preaching of the gospel? Do you really believe that? Because that's the only message which saves Nothing else will do. It must be God's gospel and His gospel only. It's not, it's not faith plus something else. God has made a complete atonement that perfectly satisfies. In fact, if you skip down to verse 16, uh, verse 16 and 17 are the famous verses by which the Reformation probably started, by the way. Verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Stop there for just a second. When you're talking with your friends, family, even to yourself, do you sometimes get ashamed of the way that God has done it? Shame on us if that's the case. Paul here says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's, it's a message for all people. It's not contained just to the Jews. It goes out to everyone. And by going out to everyone, we know this, that God is not a respecter of persons. He has declared that his salvation would come to pass in this way, and therefore we must follow this way. And Steve Lawson, if I can borrow a quote from him, he said, we are not just dogmatic about this, we are bull dogmatic about this. We are going to make certain that souls hear the gospel and repent. You see, we're not going to change the world by destroying ISIS. We're not going to change the world or make America great again by voting in a particular candidate. We're not going to... Uh, change the world and fix the world if we can fix the racial relations in America. We're not going to fix everything if we can get rid of poverty or if we can get rid of abortion. Those things are just symptoms. They're just symptoms of the problem. The problem is this, that man is at war with the holy God and God has sent his son to save his people. And it's only God who can save. And so once a pastor or a preacher has repeated himself, Three times, it's time to stop the sermon. So, we end with this. He says, also including you. He says, all these things, it includes you. Verse 6. Including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. If Paul had a calling, if he was set apart, if he belonged to Jesus Christ, if he worked mighty things for God, if he suffered mightily for God, so can we, and so ought we perhaps. And I don't know a, a, a Christian that's been walking with the Lord for more than a few years who hasn't said that their suffering has brought them closer to Christ. He says, To all those in Rome who are loved by God, 
called to be saints. We're all saints. All in Christ are saints. Grace to you. Peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the last item. The Lord Jesus Christ. That encompasses three aspects of his ministry. Christ, he was the anointed one. Anointed to serve in the temple. Anointed, he's now arisen. He's at the right hand of God, interceding as our high priest. If you're having a difficult time, he's interceding for us as our priest. Jesus, he's our Savior. He's the one who died. Jesus means Savior. And Lord, he is Master. Ephesians says that God has given them the name above every name, so that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that it is the power of God that you have Demonstrated to us, Lord, that it is not up to the wisdom of man. It is not up to our craftiness to, uh, to persuade or trick people to follow you. But that the very power of your word, accompanied by the movement of the Holy Spirit, will bring forth the harvest. And thereby the hearts of the sons will be turned to the hearts of the fathers. And the children to their mothers. And brothers to one another. And sisters to one another neighbor to neighbor and nation to nation. Lord, we look forward to that day of consolation in Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that if there's someone here who needs to remember the salvation, the love that they had for you at first, grant them that remembrance. If there are any here who have fallen away, let them return. And if there are any here, Lord, who have not embraced Christ wholly, who have only come to him for one aspect, perhaps just to have their sins forgiven and not to praise him for glory. I pray, Lord, that you would give them power to trust in this gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation and eternal life. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.